and welcome to Captains of Industry with me, Charles Mutonga. And uh, for the next half hour, we shall be speaking to Siddharth Chatterjee, who is the United Nations Resident Coordinator and also the UNDP Resident Representative here in Kenya. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Charles. Thank you so, for having me. Yeah. When I learned that I shall be talking to you, obviously there was that excitement part. And then I went onto your LinkedIn and I found quite a number of interesting things. First of all, you are half marathoner. Mm -hmm special forces veteran, among other things. But just, I'll allow you to just tell us briefly about yourself. So, you know, Charles, I started, uh, you know, uh, pretty much at ground zero. My yeah. father was a refugee from uh, when India was partitioned in 1947. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was, it was that, that was the chapter from where my life started, really. Yeah. But, uh, you know, going through school and, you know, I wasn't a good student. I was pretty much, uh, you know, at the, as a backbencher and, and did pretty poorly yeah. and my parents were worried and then you know came the opportunity to get into the National Defense Academy which is the premier military institution that prepares uh, young people to become officers in the military yeah. and I got through there only after two attempts yeah. so it wasn't that I got in in the first go mm -hmm. but having got in there that was very transformative and that's when I decided that I wanted a career in the Indian Army Special Forces so yeah. I wanted to be a parachutist and a you know and a skydiver and an underwater diver mm -hmm. so it allowed me to kind of fulfill many of those dreams I had as a young boy yeah. but I was I would just say that having joined that you know institutionally it was very transformative and mm -hmm. you know it really was laid the foundation yeah. of everything I am even today mm -hmm. and, and you went on at the Army Special Forces for 12 years how yeah. was it like well, it was great, and but you know, the, the, I saw the different spectrums of humanity there. You know, I, I was involved in counterinsurgency operations, so I was in in the front lines of combat. Yeah. I was decorated by the president, president of India, uh, for gallantry. Mm -hmm. But having said that, you know, there were certain questions that came to my mind. Yeah. You know, and it was a what should I term it as a subconscious disquiet, you know, and. Uh, what surprised me was that, you know, as educated people, you know, there would be another side of us that was capable of inflicting so much of pain and damage and violence on, yeah. on, on each other. Yeah. And that's when these questions really came up. And, and, and I made that decision that maybe it's time for me to move on yeah. and do something else, yeah. not realizing where my, uh, you know, where it would go. Mm -hmm. But as Malcolm Muggeridge, this English philosopher said that, you know, he said in the larger shapings of life, there is a plan already made into which we have no choice yeah. but to fit. Yeah. And that's something else for you was joining the UN? Well, it, it just, you know, I had no job when yeah. I was leaving, you know, but you're signed in for 20 years in the military. So I had to use every pull and push to be able to get out. I managed to get a, a, a junior security officer's job in Sarajevo, the UN mission in Sarajevo in 1997. Yeah. And that's where it all really started. Mm -hmm. And talk to us through that um, transition, because you start in that position that you mentioned, and then you rise up to the ranks. Now you're sitting at the topmost in Kenya, where UN is concerned. Right. You know, so it's, uh, I'm glad I started there yeah. because, you know, I think uh, foundations get started when you start at the bottom of the rung and then you see all the complexities and challenges that, that we face. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I moved on from, from Bosnia. I was sent to Iraq as the, as the chief of security. And, you know, it was a whole different environment there. But fortunately, other doors opened up. I just felt that I needed to go do something with programs and make a difference in people's lives. Because, you know, security is a very, it's a very finite position. It doesn't allow you to kind of, uh, you know, give you that uh, opportunity of going to the ground and being able to make an impact on, yeah. on people's lives. Yeah. And that's when I got a break. And, you know, the, um, uh, a gentleman by the name of Dennis Halliday, who was the head of the UN there, said, look, why don't you try out working in Suleimania, which is in the northeast and northern part of Iraq, a, yeah. a Kurdish province. And that's where that journey really began in 1998, you know, when I saw how the Kurds had suffered, you know, the, you know, it was as if humanity had, had abandoned them. And, you know, the, uh, the uh, Iraq was under sanctions, you know, they were, you know, they were uh, under a lot of threat from the neighboring countries. And to see that, you know, there was not even a hospital, not even proper water facilities. Yeah. And that's when I realized, you know, what the UN collectively can actually do when it comes together. And the difference it made, the rapidity with which children got immunized, you know, facilities were opened up, yeah. access to schools, better education, the whole, you know, uh, UN family from UNICEF to UNDP and all these came together to improve electricity, power, yeah. employment generation. Yeah. I was helping to coordinate all that over there. Yeah. So those two, two and a half years were perhaps the best hands-on yeah. learning experience. And from there, I was picked and brought to uh, South Sudan by UNICEF. So I opened the first office inside South Sudan. And this was a South Sudan in, in June of 2000, which was at war. Yeah. 
it was it was the war with the north but it was also the same war between between uh, the SPLA which was then led by John Garang mm -hmm. and the SPDF which was led by uh, by uh, Riyadh Machar so it was a very similar circumstance but then living in there was when I could actually tell you know when you had to get all your resources together and actually make a difference on the ground over there so he said you know when my boss asked me here in Nairobi who used to sit here a, a, a dynamic man by the name of Dr. Sharad Sapra he said you know what is that one thing we can do to kind of change the situation here I said you know what let's get all the children out of the military out of the out of the out of the rebel army he says do you think that's possible I said well why don't we give it a try and it was three months of real trying that when uh, both John Garang and, and Commander Salvakir, then, now the president of South Sudan, yeah. relented and said, OK, let's go for it. Mm -hmm. And at the first go, we managed to get about 3,551 child soldiers out from the front lines of the conflict, yeah. brought them to a place in Rumbek, where we were. And you know, Charles, I think that was where yeah. I learned a lot of things about how you could actually bring people together to make an impact in the way we could see these child soldiers who were transitioning from being killers and soldiers yeah. into going back to being boys. You know, that psychosocial transformation, that physical transformation, you know, being able to access, you know, nutritious food, water, health facilities, you know, getting an education. Yeah. Those six months that they stayed with us, difficult, mind you. These yeah. are, you know, these are young boys after yeah. all. Yeah. You know. yeah. But getting them back to their original selves as being boys and then seeing them being reunited with their families. You know, I realized that day when that final last boy left yeah. to be reunited with, with his mother and father and his village and his community, that, you know, the UN mm -hmm. is actually an institution that can make such a dramatic difference, yeah, yeah. You know, such a dramatic difference. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I, what, I, what I appreciated about the organization that I'm, I was working with in UNICEF was they had an executive director by the name of Carol Bellamy who was willing to take some of these risks. These were very risky environments. These were environments at war, but they gave their staff the opportunity and the and the initiative to be able to take those initiatives despite those conditions. Yeah. And that, to me, was perhaps the best leadership experience, the best experience of humanity, yeah. to be able to bring 140, 150 people together from your team, to be able to actually focus on something but this really had a ripple effect. The way the community started to respond to us, they saw us as people that could actually be those agents of change. A lot of these young boys, you know, have gone on to becoming adults now. You know, this yeah. happened in the year 2001 and, yeah. you know, and, and taken up responsible positions. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, that period from Bosnia to Iraq to South Sudan, yeah. should I say the best open university I could have gone to because that laid my critical foundation yeah. into understanding the diversity and the complexity of the United Nations system. All right. And now we fast forward to uh, 2013 when now there was this appointment to the UN United Nations Population Fund in Kenya. And uh, it, it was not something that was so easy for you because after that we had a very big conversation because of you being the son-in-law to former Secretary General um, of the UN Ban Ki-moon. How did you navigate such an allegation of maybe being a beneficiary of nepotism? Right, right. You know, so, you know, people don't realize that I did actually join the UN in 1997. And uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon came into the UN in 2007. So yeah. I had a 10-year lead time yeah. over him. Yeah. And let me say that, you know, from 1997 to 2004, I'd already jo uh, jumped four ranks and become a deputy chief of uh, deputy head of programs of the deputy country representative in UNICEF Somalia. Yeah. So I'd already had a, a career which was in place. Mm -hmm. And it was in 2007 when Mr. Ban came and became um, the, the UN Secretary General. Guess what? I dropped an appointment to go to UNESCO as their representative in Kathmandu mm -hmm. and instead opted to go to Baghdad yeah. to serve with an old boss of mine called Staffan de Mistura. Mm -hmm. And that was considered an act of nepotism. And since then, you know, the, the issue of nepotism never left me. But you know what? Having said that, you know, I came under a lot of press grueling and all that. It was a learning experience for me. I think it was also very transformative in many, many ways. There were things that I possibly may not have done, which happened as a result of this pressure that I came under. So while, you know, my career kind of took a bit of a, 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 a backseat for those 10 years, yeah. But at the same time, it allowed me to do other things, you know, explore other universe, uh, opportunities. Yeah. I stepped back, went back to school and, you know, I got admission into Princeton University, you know, started to write, got a blog, went and worked at the Red Cross, which probably would not have happened yeah. had the situation not. So, in the, as I said, in the larger shapings of life, yeah. all these things actually came 
came up for the best. Now, when I got the UNFPA appointment, it came through a it came through a headhunting firm called Egon Zender. Yeah. And when Egon Zender uh, reached out to me, uh, they so I, I was I was open to it because I'd already finished with uh, about three years in in the Red Cross. And why UNFPA? Because you know I'm a passionate believer in the whole issue of gender equality. I call myself a feminist. Yeah. You know I really believe that men must stand up for the rights of women. And perhaps that was an opening. It was like God sent yeah. that you know here is where I can actually fulfill some of those ambitions that I have in making an impact on 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 the on the lives of women, adolescent girls, children. And that's how this door opened. So regardless of of the of the noise of yeah. nepotism, it was there. It yeah. was through a process of an interview. It was done by a headhunting firm, and you know I was the best person for for that role when I was yeah. selected. All right. And, and uh, before we started this interview, you told me that you wake up at three a.m. every day, and one of the things that you do is writing. And we've yes. seen you your your articles in different publications across the world, uh, but particularly rights of women and children. You've written about FGM, you've written about gender taxation and many other issues that uh, refer to these two groups. Where does this passion come from? You know, I come from a very traditional Indian home, yeah. you know, and like Kenya, we have very sim many similarities, you know. My grandmother, for instance, was married at the age of 11 mm -hmm. and, you know, she had uh, 15 children mm -hmm. from then. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the scourge of child marriage, you know, the scourge of early marriage, the situation of women being underdogs in a family. FGM is nothing but an act of, of men to keep women subjugated. There is no reason. There is no beneficial reason. There is no, uh, you know, uh, reasonable excuse for a woman to be cut and a female gentle mutilation to be done. Now, the issue here is that unless we as men speak up, and actually get onto that driver's seat and say, let's get onto he for she. Let's stand up for the rights of women. All right, let's just take a pause there as we just take a short break. Do not go too far because the gentleman just sitting right next to me will be with us to just talk about what he thinks of the UN work, what they are doing in Kenya, and the leadership space in Africa and the globe. Do not go too far. Welcome back to Captains of Industry with me, Charles Vitonga, and I'm still sitting with the UN Resident Representative here in Kenya and also the UNDP Kenya Resident Representative. Thank you so much for your time. And we've talked about your story, where you've come from, some of the work that you've been involved with um, at the UN in Kenya, but you have this vision of delivering as one. I believe that this is perhaps one of the few countries in Africa, maybe the world, where a head of state actually sits with the United Nations system, with the government, with the key line ministries, mm -hmm. and reviews the United Nations Development Assistance Framework. Mm -hmm. We have some unusual programs in this country, where, which is actually being seen as a best practice across the globe. Mm -hmm. Take, for example, in 2015, along with the First Lady's Beyond Zero campaign, mm -hmm. we weaved in the entire ecosystem of improving reproductive maternal child adolescent health. Mm -hmm. When we analyzed what was going on, we found out that 15 counties of Kenya contributed to about 98% of the maternal deaths mm -hmm. out of the 47. Mm -hmm. Now, of those 15, there were six counties which contributed to 50% of these maternal deaths, which was Mandera, Baji, Marsabet, Lamo, Isiolo, and Migori. Mm -hmm. So what we said was, let's go there. So as a UN family, we came together, UNFPA, UNICEF, WHO, UN Women, UNAIDS, the World Bank, you know, USA, DFID, Norway, Denmark, Sweden. But the leadership came from the government. Leadership came from the county authorities. Leadership came from the county governors. Charles, what's interesting is we had Deloitte do an analysis of this of this implementation that we did, yeah. and there was about fifteen million dollars which was unlocked by the uh, by the by the British government and the Norwegian government, which came our way. In these six counties, the rapidity with which transformation has actually taken place and the results of a drop in maternal mortality was quite significant. Yeah. Now, this would not have happened had we not had the political will. Yeah of the government mm -hmm. and of the counties. Mm -hmm. This would not have happened if we didn't have the right public policies of a free maternal health care and the First Lady's Beyond Zero campaign, which really brought the whole national consciousness towards, towards the issue of the status of women and girls and their, and their health. But the third thing 
was a very exciting partnership which came together. And in this partnership, you'll be surprised, even the private sector joined in. Mm -hmm. Companies like Philips, yeah. Unilever, Merck, Safaricom, Huawei, Kenya Healthcare Federation, you know, who, who joined up and said, we want to join this. Yeah. In 2015, at the, at the, at the UN General Assembly, uh, at, a, at an event called Every Woman, Every Child, you know, in front of the former Secretary General, President Kenyatta, Bob Collymore was there and they made this announcement. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, what we are now seeing is actually Kenya is showing the way on how a public-private partnership mm -hmm. could help leapfrog yes. primary health care in this country. Now that is where we need all hands on board. Mm -hmm. That is where we need the leadership at the national level, we need leadership at the county level. Mm -hmm. We need the public-private to come together, not from a point of view of corporate social responsibility, yeah. but from a point of view of a return of investment, mm -hmm where we make, we make it sustainable, where we make it make sure that people have access to good quality primary health care. Because yeah. two things will transform Kenya now. Good access to primary health care, so you have a healthy population, mm -hmm. and good access to quality education and skills. Mm -hmm. So for Vision 2030 to happen, yeah. these two are going to be fundamental. Mm -hmm. But added to this will be what I would term as the four E's education and skills, yeah. the empowerment of women, they need to get into the workforce. Yeah. Third is we need a Marshall Plan yeah. of employment. Yeah. Just the same kind of Marshall Plan that happened after the Second World War with yeah. the European countries. Yeah. That's the kind of investment. So Kenya and, and, and Sub-Saharan Africa needs to become an investment destination. If you don't want your young people to start coming to the cities or migrating to Europe and elsewhere, yeah. That's what we will need. Yeah. And finally, it's equity. Equity yeah. is going to be crucial so that no part of the country feels it's been left behind. Mm -hmm. If we've got these four E's right, yeah. essentially we've an analyzed Kenya can grow its economy by 12 times. Yeah. But critical sectors, agriculture, mm -hmm. huge employment opportunities. Keep in mind, every year, one million Kenyans from the age group of 15 to 24 are joining the workforce. Mm -hmm. So they need jobs, agriculture, mm -hmm. infrastructure, you know, small, medium scale enterprises. Right now, with a one million joining the workforce, there are barely about 100,000 new jobs being created. Yeah. Now, this will require vision. This will require, you know, uh, the, the, the public policies that I spoke about. Mm -hmm. But critically, what we're seeing is the convergence of such important partnerships that can make it. Because if Kenya will do it, yeah. the rest of Africa will follow. And in my view, Kenya is a beacon of hope in a region mired in, in yeah. instability and fragility. Mm -hmm. They need that beacon of hope to emulate. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about one E, which is employment, jobs. You've mm -hmm. mentioned about the need to create one million jobs in Kenya so that we are every able year. to every year so that to, we are able to bring in more youth, more youth get, get employed. Um, but there's also the conversation of technology, mm -hmm. digitization, yeah. artificial intelligence. Yeah. Maybe this technology has not yet caught up with Kenya as much, but how do we make sure we are creating the balance? Because we cannot ignore that part. Too. That's, that's true. But the fact is that Kenya is also the hotbed of technology and, and innovation, the kind of creativity which is happening here. I mean, take, an exa take for example, you know, uh, a company like Safaricom. You know, through technology, it is inadvertently creating close to about you know, 500 to 600,000 jobs yes. simply because there are so many people who are able to, in, uh, you know, either which way through a small outlet be able to do that. I think technology can be woven in to a multifaceted side. Yes. But the real fact is that when you look at the median age of a farmer in Kenya, which is 61, yeah. the median age of a Kenyan is 18. Mm -hmm. We have very few young people on those farms. Yeah. The only way to get them to the farm is to bring the convergence of technology, you know, opportunity and a return of investment. You need much more young people hands on board at these farms. But you, then you have to make agriculture as attractive. I mean, why is it that in a country like Denmark, you could have a plumber and a surgeon sitting on the same table and perhaps the plumber may be slightly richer than the surgeon? Mm -hmm. I think that dignity of labor is going to be crucial. So, you know, while you can bring in all the technology possible, Kenya is still a young population, yeah. you know, and it's, a, and it's a smaller population, it's 46 million. But don't forget that the population is also expanding rapidly. Kenya was 7 million, the same as Sweden in 1956. Sweden today is 10 million, Kenya is 46 million. By 2030, with the current total fertility rate, Kenya will be 65 million, and by 2050, it'll be 85 million. Africa will be 2.3 billion. We have to create the jobs because, you know, um, your President Kenyatta once said that, you know, he says the youth unemployment is an existentialist threat, not only to Kenya, but to the rest of Africa. And it becomes a global threat because if imagine, you know, in Africa, there are about 10 to 12 million uh, young people looking for jobs. 
but there are barely about two or three million jobs. Yes. So it is a collective responsibility. I believe it's a responsibility of the West to look at creating investments, opportunities here so that they have less people. You know, you need migrants. They, will, they, they are experiencing what is called a demographic echo. The West is aging. You know, median age Kenya, 18. Yes. Median age Sweden is 47. So you want those migrants to, to come in, qualified migrants. But at the same time, you want to make sure that these countries become sources of, of, of revenue. And, the, and then it becomes a win-win for all sides when public-private partnerships emerge, yes. opportunities for, because you know, this is going to be a large, a large consumer market. 2.3 billion is a big number. Yes. Agriculture, for example, will be a $1 trillion industry, agribusiness by 2030. Yes. What an excellent opportunity. Again, a country like Kenya can lead the way on this one. Mm -hmm. So to me, if you're seeing me energetic and enthusiastic about it, I really believe it's possible to do it. I've seen what has happened in a small scale maternal and child health program in six of the most difficult counties when everybody thought it was not going to work. The fact is that the Kenyan government has put its foot on the pedal and said, let's try and achieve universal health coverage. And that just needs what I've termed as the convergence of the, of, of the three Ps, mm -hmm. pulling it together. All right, I was just going to ask you about what next after we have these partnerships on healthcare for Kenya to get that that goal of universal health care. What about investments? Because exactly. I, th I think uh, we've had an issue there with investment, especially from the government, maybe encouraging the private sector to come of in. Course. How do we bring that investment part together, make sure that puzzle works? Okay, let me give you an example. So today there, are, there is the Africa Development Bank, the World, uh, you know, the World Bank. There are plenty of funds out there. There are plenty of private sector companies that would want to come and invest. But they have to see that there's a clear return of investment. That's how you know, uh, the government uh, has set up what is called a sustainable development goal number three platform. In fact, the foreign minister of Kenya, uh, Ambassador Amina Mohammed, launched this platform in New York on the 17th of September. The who's who of the UN came for this, for, for this, uh, for this event. We had the UNDP administrator there, Akim Steiner. We had the UNFPA. Uh, executive Director there, um, uh, Natalia Kanem. We had the UNAIDS Executive Director, uh, Michelle Sidibi. Really, you know, it was uh, in great attendance. Kenya is actually showing the way of how to leapfrog this. So when you're, and we had the CEO of Philips there, we had, you know, people from Unilever, you know, many, many companies. What we are saying is, look, let's create that enabling environment where at the county level, the national government, the county government, the UN, the private sector sit down and come up with a business plan. Mm -hmm. And that business plan must look at what are the basic essentials of primary health care needs. Okay, what, is the, what are the five or six big things? Mm -hmm. Fortunately, McKinsey yeah. has been kind of helping us think this whole thing through and they've been doing a fantastic job and for free uh, up till now to, in, in, in supporting us with this. Mm -hmm. When we come up for that business plan, we go back and look at how to finance it. Now, what kind of financing will the government bring? What will the county bring? What will the private sector bring? What will the multilateral institutions bring? Can we attract, attract foreign direct investment into yes. it? How do we open up the space for the insurance company? Yes. My friend, this is a country where it's possible to do it. Yes. And we get it right here. Finally and briefly, I mean, as we were talking, I couldn't help but notice the acknowledgement that you have for people that you work with, people that you interacted with, and leadership. Just Finally, what is that secret of yours uh, that goes into how you conduct your leadership, how you offer leadership to different teams that you work with and to different initiatives that you're involved in? You know, one, there was a very basic principle that the army teaches you is, you know, to lead by example and to be out there in front. Mm -hmm. But in the UN, you have to understand how to lead from behind. Yeah. And, you know, it is about making sure that as a leader, when something goes wrong, you're the first person to go and take the, take the fall for it. Mm -hmm. But when things go right, yes. you are quick to give credit to the people that have actually done it. I believe it's about trust. I believe it's about transparency. And I believe it's about genuine feeling of empathy for each and everyone, from a driver to the head of the UN. Yes. That sense of empathy needs to be there. After all, we are humans. You know, yeah. we, are, we are tactile people. You know, we need... We need comfort and caring, and we should not create an environment which is threatening. I mean, that is when things start to go wrong. And that's why even in UNFP, I asked, uh, actually asked for a 360 performance, 360-degree uh, performance review of myself, you know, and I posted it in, in, in the public domain because I wanted to get a perspective from my 
subordinates, from my colleagues in the UN, from the donor partners, from government of Kenya, from civil societies, how am I performing? And I think every leader should constantly get that 360 degree loop because what it does, it helps us to improve. Because ultimately, there is no one person who can do it. It yeah. always has to be a team. So that spirit to core and the camaraderie yeah. that the special forces teaches you applies to every sphere of life. All right. Thank you so much, Sid, for your time. My pleasure. And that was Siddharth Chatterjee, who is the UNDP resident representative in Kenya and also the UN resident coordinator here in Kenya again. And uh, that brings to a close um, this edition of Captains of Industry with me, Charles Kitonga. See you soon. Mm -hmm.